I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is where we're going to be preaching from this morning. My name is Steve Kelly, by the way. I'm the preaching minister here. If you're visiting with us today, there's a lot of new faces that are out here. We're glad that you're with us. We're not going to make you stand. We're not going to, you know, embarrass you in any way. But we just want to say we're glad that you're here. Before you leave, though, in the back, there is a blue uh, welcome packet. We'd love for you to take that. And it uh, tells you a little bit about our church. If you have any questions, you can write down uh, questions there. You can leave them in your chair. We'll pick them up. You can call the office. We'd love to just share with you a little bit about the church. And if you're a regular visitor here and you see someone new you don't know, walk up to them and say hi. I've already introduced myself to three people who have already been here for a year. So don't worry about it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, well, nice to meet you. But anyway, so uh, I've already embarrassed myself. So, um, you know, while we were traveling, we met a couple of young, young people at this um, preschool. And I don't want to give the whole story away. We'll, we'll save it because it's an amazing story. But this young boy was quoting Psalm 23. Um, most of us know Psalm 23. I mean, about every funeral that I've ever preached, I've always had some reference to Psalm 23 or read parts of it because Psalm 23 is one of those passages of the scripture that just gives us comfort. It, it, you know, when we talk about the Lord being our shepherd and those different things here, it just gives us comfort. And so what I want to do today is I want to just read through it together and then I want to kind of break it down into about four areas and four scenes in which we see God as being this, this awesome comforter. So just follow along with me as I I read Psalm 23. David will write, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day that you've given us. I thank you, Father, for allowing us to come here to worship you in freedom. Father, I know that even this day around the world, there are people who are gathered in the name of Christ, and they do so with fear of people coming in to attack them, to harm them. Father, to disrupt their services. We pray for those people, Father, that you would watch over them, that you would protect them. Father, I thank you for your word that guides us and that comforts us, especially this psalm here, Father, that David had poured out his heart. But Father, every believer can say these words and know that you watch over us in those times of darkness, in the times of struggles and trials. Father, we know that you are with us. And Father, when nothing else can comfort us, we know that your love and your word does. Father, use me just to be your servant this morning, to just share your word, that we all might be encouraged, Father, and know that you are truly the great shepherd. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On your bulletin on the back there is an outline that you can follow along as we kind of break this down, four major areas, a couple of sub-points we want to say. The first picture that we see about God as a great comfort is this, and that is the shepherd and the sheep. The shepherd and the sheep. Now, most of us don't live on farms anymore. We, we don't live in an agrarian society. But some of you have probably grown up uh, around farm animals and stuff like that. I was mentioning the first service, just driving down through town, uh, through Lehigh, just, just the other day. And I saw chickens out in someone's yard here, like in Lehigh. And I'm like, really? What are we doing? You know, you know ch chickens in Lehigh. But they were out there. And... Uh, in India, it didn't surprise me. There was cows and chickens and, you know, wild animals just roaming around and just everywhere. And, and I thought, you know, I come back to the States and all of a sudden we see it again. But we don't normally see that unless we live on a farm. And so most of us then kind of miss out on some of the analogies of the things in here. But shepherds meant a lot to the nation of Israel. Because if you go back and look at the, from the very beginning when God called Abraham, that God called him that Abraham had uh, flocks and herds. In fact, that's how he increases. And then we look down through the story about Jacob. It was Jacob who knew how to breed the flocks in a, in a way that allowed his flocks to grow and Laban's flocks did not grow. And so they had this heart for a shepherd. Even though they didn't necessarily consider them high class society, we see that in the story of Jesus. The shepherds are out in the fields and God sends the angel to make the announcement to them and they're kind of standoffish from everybody else. But, but down in their hearts, they love the concept of a shepherd. And so God then is referred to as this great shepherd when he says, the Lord, the Lord God. 
Jehovah God, Yahweh God, however you want to say, the Lord Almighty is my shepherd here. I shall not be in one, he says, and he makes me to lie down in green pastures. First thing I want you to understand is this. The shepherd provides for the sheep's needs. The shepherd provides for the sheep's needs. They are lacking nothing. When I, when I was thinking about this idea of providing and lacking, I began to think about my relationship to Michelle. I, I'm her husband and I love her and I care for her and I do the very best of my ability to want to provide for her and for my family. But no matter how much I do, no matter how many times I might try to, you know, uh, make a day special for her or whatever, I'm always going to be lacking. There's always something that's going to go amiss. I'm going to forget an anniversary. I'm going to forget a name. I'm going to not pay attention during a conversation or whatever it is. And so no matter how many hugs or kisses I give, there's always something that falls short of what she really needs. And I've come to realize that I'm not the best provider that she has. God is the best provider that she has. And that's what's being described in here. No matter how much we love somebody, whether it be our spouse or our children or our family or whatever it is, that we will always fall short in providing them everything they need. Because none of us can provide all the things that each other needs. But God can. David paints this picture that when the Lord is my shepherd, there's not something I'm lacking. There's not something that I'm still wanting. There's not something that I still need because God is providing for me. He goes on to say, and the second part here is that the shepherd renews the strength of the sheep. Because in verse 2 he says that he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the quiet waters. Now, when we read this, and when I used to read this, I thought, oh, this is just like a poetic little statement here. And, and, and he's just kind of making this statement of, well, you know, he just leads me into those green fields where it's all nice and the grass is lush. And he, and he takes me down the little, the little creek bank where the stream is flowing and that sort of stuff. But David is really saying a whole lot more here. Sheep herders have said that for sheep to lie down, there has to be at least four conditions met. Their first one is this, they have to be free of all fear. Free of all fear. And I thought, you know, that's not only true in, in animals, I think that's true in people. How many of you are not able to sleep when you fear something that's going to happen the next day? Maybe it's a test, maybe it's an exam, maybe it's a job interview, or maybe it's a, a court case hearing or whatever it is. There might be something, maybe there's a bully on the playground and you got you know, you to face them the next day or whatever it is, you don't know. But when, when we have fear inside, it just kind of keeps us awake at night. And sheep are that way, when they're, when they're fearful, when they think like the, the, the you know, wolf might attack them or, or you know, some, some animal might attack them or they might go off the cliff and die or something, they're, they're not able to just be calm and so they have to be free of fear. The second thing they say is, this. They have to be free of friction within the flock. They don't want to be at odds with one another. And so when they're at odds with one another, then they, they can't calm down. And I think the same thing, same thing with us, you know, when, when there's friction in the home, when mom and dad aren't getting along, fight with your wife, you know, or fighting with your kids, it's kind of, you know, Thanksgiving meal's not so fun uh, sometimes. And, and so there needs to be a friction that needs to go away. And so that is something that God allows to happen. When God's working, he says he makes me to lie down. He's removing that friction. Third thing is this, that there has to be free of torment from the flies and from the insects. When I was a young boy, we had a dairy farm and I just remember so much watching the, the cows, you know, as they were uh, being taken into the milking parlor or wherever and the flies, it would just come around them, you know, be around their eyes and around their nose and just on there and you watch them all the time, their tails swatting the fly and trying to just say, you know, I'm just tired of being tormented. Michelle and I went um, to, a, uh, to North Carolina. We went camping one time. And so we went out and, and we'd set up the tent and everything in the middle of the, in the, middle of the day. And then as the, as the sun began to set, you know how it is. It's like here, the insects came out and the mosquitoes came out. And they were just, they were terrible. The, the, like here, they were terrible. And before the night was over, before the ranger had come around to kind of collect our bill, Michelle and I started packing up because we were ready to go. And the ranger knew it. He's like, mosquitoes are too bad. We're like, yeah, these suckers will carry you away. And so we just, we're like, there's no way we could enjoy it. And and we weren't the only ones that left. So there was other people that were leaving too. The fourth thing is this. They got to be free of feeling of hunger. I don't know about you, but man, I cannot function when I'm hungry. I don't think very well. I mean, all I think about is food, you know? And as you could tell, I don't miss too much. But, you know, um, I just... Sometimes when we are hungry, when we are tired, when we are lonely, when those things are going on, we're not able to function. And, and what are you saying here is that God is fulfilling those needs. If I'm able to lie down in green pastures and I'm able to be free of fear and I don't have friction in the flock and there aren't things that are tormenting me and I don't have feelings of hunger because God is bringing me to those things. It talks about how he leads them to the quiet waters. 
When sheep are left unattended and they're thirsty, they will seek out any water source they can find. Most animals are this way, sheep especially. And they will go to the dirtiest water hole. It might be polluted. It might have disease in there. And it will not matter because their thirst is driving them to drink from it. I was amazed at the water that we saw in India. Every single river or stream we came to was polluted. Every single one of them. I mean, just, I mean, I grew up along the Ohio River. The Ohio River, I, don't, I have never seen the Ohio River blue. It is always brown. It's, if you've been along the Ohio River, it's always muddy water. It's always nasty, you know. And, and, and every stream that we came to in India was that way. And that you would see a, you would see a person down in there washing or bathing or, or animals right over here drinking from the water and people drawing out water to wash off the, the dirt off of their car or their little moped. And then down a little way would be someone drawing out water to take back to their home to wash their clothes or maybe even to cook with and stuff. And it was just, it was just amazing how dirty it was. I could not possibly imagine how sickening it was. I mean, we, we didn't drink anything unless it came out of a bottle. No ice, no, I mean, if it wasn't in a bottle, we didn't, I learned my lesson the first time, right? I wouldn't, but I just saw this. Sheep will go there. And what he's saying here is that God brings me beside that quiet waters. That water's where they can, co- they can come and they can drink without fear. They can drink and they can satisfy their thirst without fear of, of being sickened by that. The second picture, though, that we see of, of God in this is the guide and the traveler. The guide and the traveler. In verse 3, it says this, that he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What I want to say is this, that he guides them along the right paths. When I see the word righteous, I like to just think of the word that he does what is right. God always does what is right. And so uh, when we see this, that he guides us in a righteousness, if we're going to live in a righteousness, then we need to live in his rightness is a way of thinking about it. What is a guide? Who is a guide? A guide is someone that's either been there before or they know how to do it. They, they've done it themselves. When my parents took a trip down to, the, to Jamaica, I've never been there before, but they went to Jamaica once for a vacation. And while they were there, they took this, this tour that walked up this waterfall. Maybe some of you have been there, maybe to the same place, I don't know. But they walked up this waterfall, but every group that went up this waterfall had a guide that was with them. And that guide would tell them where they could step. They'd tell them to step in this, this rock here, or put your foot on this ledge, or be careful because there's that slippery, or there's a hole over here. And so the whole group walked up, the guide went first, then the next person, the next person and single file all the way up. When they got up to the top, they all got up safely and then they were able to kind of come down this waterfall sort of like in a, a lo- not a log flume, but like a water slide kind of kind of thing down in, down in there. You know, that is the picture of what's going on here. God has been there. God knows the right way. God knows where to set your foot. The Bible talks about how his word is a light unto my path and he guides the way in which we should go. And Jesus leads us through there. And so what makes him one of the great as a great shepherd is that he guides us in the ways that we do not know I don't always know what the next step is I don't always know what the next turn should be I don't always know what the next decision should be and so we have to just pray to the Lord and read the word and let God guide us because God knows the right path he also protects and he comforts us along our travels Verse 4 says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, we don't always know the right, the right way to go. And so we trust in God. But even in trusting in God, there's always a little bit of element of fear in us wondering, will we be okay? You know, when, when, we go, when we go out of the country, this is one of the things that always makes me nervous is being out of the country. Because I, I tell myself that when I, was in the, when I was in the military, I was in the, in the anti-terrorism, like an anti-terrorism group. And so we saw all the very bad things that would happen, which you see happening now, you know, and people getting taken and abducted and all the different stuff that's going on. Everybody that hates America and everybody, you know, it always makes me nervous. And so when I'm out there, I'm just like in my little box, you know, I don't, I'm always watching, I'm always paranoid. And I have to be reminded that sometimes you get out in a place where you cannot be protected except by the grace of God. And I told a friend of mine who was a missionary the first time we went to India, I told him how nervous I was and how I was scared and couldn't make, you know, speak the language and didn't know what was going to happen and all that. And all he said was good. I was really mad at him. I was like, seriously, you know, you should be comforting me. And he said, good. He said, because now you have to trust God. And he, he was so right. You know, sometimes we get put in a place where we just say, God, I have to trust that you will protect us. And he does protect us. And not only does he protect us, but he comforts us along the travel. 
There are two types of rods that a shepherd would carry. One was sort of like a club, a stick that was used to defend against the wild animals. You know, when the wolf would come around, maybe to attack the flock, they could beat them off or the, a lion or whatever. And then there's the shepherd's crook. And that's all that we really remember is the shepherd's crook. And we think this is so loving. And that's the one that's used to kind of bring the wandering sheep back in. But the sheep need both. And the thing that gives them comfort is knowing that I can be brought back in and rescued, but also knowing that I can be defended. Uh, and that's what the sheep would understand, that the shepherd has the tools necessary to defend them against an enemy and also has a tool to rescue them. Know that God does both. God rescues us from sin, but he also defends us against the attacks of Satan. That's why the Bible tells us to put on the full armor of God. Why do we put on the armor of God? So that we are protected from the attacks of Satan. And there are times when God has to use that thing that he uses to protect us to sometimes get our attention. Sometimes he needs to get our attention in a way that says, hey, wake up, be careful, don't go to the ledge, don't get sucked into that temptation. But sometimes when I think about it, it does bring me comfort to know that God has tools both to wake me up to sin and to pull me back from the ledge when I cannot do it myself. The third thing that we see here in this picture is the picture of the host and the guest. The host and the guest. In verse 5 it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And what I understand as I read through here is that the Lord treats us as royal guests. The Lord treats us as royal guests. Most of us have never been treated like royalty. But I have to tell you that when we went to this trip, we just got treated like royalty. The four of us that were there, I mean, they just did everything they could to make us feel loved and welcome. They, you know, they, they come and they'd open up your door for you. They wouldn't let you carry your bags. They, they would take it everywhere. You know, they would, they would uh, make it, you know, get you the food that you wanted as much as what they could get. They made sure that you always had water. And when we would go walk somewhere, there were people would be in front of us. There would be guys behind us so that no one would come around and, and mess with us. Because we walked through some, some scary areas sometimes as you would go into the inner city church. Everybody, you know, I don't blend in with the local. You know what I'm saying? And so they're all looking at you and they think every, every man, every, every American there has got to be you know, a rich, wealthy American. Because that's what they see on TV and that's what they think of and that sort of thing there. And, and they just made us feel wonderful. I was mentioning earlier that even when we sat down to eat, like they just constantly were serving us. You know, Jay and his wife and Amretta, Ernest's wife were constantly serving us. And, and I said this and the guys threw me under the bus, so I'll say it again. But I said, we, were, we said we were going to come home and tell our wives, you know, how they needed to step, step it up and stuff like over there they all they all they bailed on me you know I was like what a bunch of bums but they just seriously they treated us so nicely because they wanted us to know that we were loved I want you to know that God sees you as a royal guest I mean the Bible says that we are priests and kings unto the Lord that we are grafted in to the family tree of God that we are made royalty and every time in the Bible, especially you look in the Old Testament, it talks about coming in the presence of God. It always talks about this great banquet that is there. And, when, and it's like they would talk about sitting down at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And their concept was like going to this giant golden corral in the sky where you could get whatever you wanted. And the chocolate fountain was always flowing and that sort of stuff there. And I just want you to understand that God treats you like a royal guest. And that's what David is saying here. The fourth picture that we see is this. That's the picture of the physician and the patient. The physician and the patient. In the latter part of verse 5, it says this. It says that you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And what I want to say is this, is that God cares for the wounded. God cares for the wounded. Philip Keller wrote a book, A Shepherd's Look, at, the, at Psalm 23. It's, it's a great read. It's not very long. I'd, in, I'd encourage you to read it. I have a copy in my office if you'd like to see it. But he says this. He said that sheep are bothered by flies, gnats, and other pests in the summertime. And the most damaging of these creatures is the nasal fly. It is attracted to the warm, moist mucus of the nose. And it will invade the nasal cavity. And it lays its eggs in there. And as they hatch, they will, they will cause great irritation and discomfort. In fact, it says that the sheep will begin to beat his head on the ground or against a tree to rid himself of the pest. And so the solution then is for the shepherd to make up a concoction of oils and spices of sulfur and place it on the sheep's nose and on the sheep's head. And this application must be done several times throughout the hot summer months to give the sheep some comfort. In this application, we see that we are very much like sheep. 
When we are unprotected, Satan sends things our way that at first annoy us, and then they take hold and they nest inside of us, and they cause us great pain, and that great pain is sin. And just as a shepherd has to care for the sheep and put the ointment on the sheep to give him some relief, the God of the creation, the great physician, cares for us and he anoints us with the Holy Spirit when we come under the saving grace of Jesus Christ and he helps to get rid of the pesty things that are in our lives and brings a soothingness to our lives. And I just want to say this, that God has the ability to solve all of our problems. He can heal all of our sicknesses. Even if he does not, it doesn't mean that he cannot. Even if he does not, it doesn't mean that he cannot. He can do all things. The second part of this is that he restores with abundance. The body is made up mostly of water. Most of we've learned that from science class. We all know that. And without water, then the body will cease to operate, right? We start getting dehydrated. It's not very long before death will follow. And David says in this statement here, he says that my, my cup overflows. And the idea is that God has given him all that he needs, not only to survive, but to thrive, there's a very big difference between surviving and thriving. I think there are so many Christians who are just merely surviving. We just get enough of God, just get enough of church, just get enough of worship to get through this day or through this week, but not enough to really transform our lives so that we are thriving. You know, the, uh, the Casting Crowns even has that song in the very lyrics that says that we are made to thrive. The Bible says that God has come to bring us life and life abundantly. And yet I just think that too many of us are just barely getting by. We're just barely living the life that God wants us to live instead of living an abundant life. Instead of asking God to let my cup overflow, fill me with the spirit that not only satisfies me, but it just runs over. That I might wet the people who are around me, that I might satisfy the thirst that are around me. Are those not the people that you want to be around? Those are the people that I want to be around. The people that just have the word of God flowing with them and the spirit of God flowing in them that just makes you say, I got to have what you have. And I think that the church is not growing because we don't have that sometimes. That we just go through life, well, I just barely got enough. We are so anemic as a church that we just barely have enough to get by. But we all seem to look a little peaked too often. We need to look joyous and look like that we have the full life of God in us. And that's what David is saying. David is saying that he has protected me and he has anointed my head with oil. He cares for me when I have those pesty things in life. But God also is pouring into my life where it is overflowing. Flowing. Now, let me tell you that God is not going to run out of water. He is not going to run out of that. I think that's why it even talks about Jesus, that he is the living water. Because, man, when you're thirsty, nothing satisfies you like just a drink of water. And we need to understand that God gives it to us in an abundance, overflowing way. After seeing all of the care that God has for him, David writes these final words in verse 6. He says, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. David is saying that with a shepherd like God, that there is no other outcome but goodness. There is no other outcome but love to follow me all the days of my life. When you really understand what God has done for you and where you stand in relationship to an almighty God, you would have to come to this same conclusion and say, only goodness and love can follow me all the days of my life. We've been doing through a study on our Wednesday night through the book of Revelation. And I said earlier uh, to the first crowd, I said, it's so hard to preach through that book because we already know the end. And the ending is this, Christians win. I mean, it's, it's, it's just hard to even keep the, keep the, the excitement going on because you, you know in the end, you know, new heaven, new earth comes and new Jerusalem and all this and, and Satan's defeated and sin's defeated and there's no more crying, there's no more tears and everything's wiped away and the river of life has flown again. There's all this excitement and, and we win in the end. If we know that, why does it not empower us now? If we know that, we ought to say as Christians, the only thing that we can say is that goodness and love will follow me every day as I walk in a life with Jesus Christ. Christ. David is saying that, that I have this great shepherd and there is no other outcome except goodness and love. And with this in mind, he makes this final statement, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Bible talks about how someone has come to know the sweetness of God and yet fallen away come to know the glory of God and yet something happens in their life and they've fallen away. 
I know that theology has created all kinds of denominations, but you and I know people who have loved Jesus for many, many years and something happens and they just turn their back on the church. So I don't know how we work through that theology other than to say that sometimes life can take the wind out of our sails, but I don't understand how you can abandon the Lord. Where else will you go? Who else will care for you? Who else can make it better? God is the only one. God is the only one. And David is making this statement that I understand what God has done for me and I understand how God cares for me and only goodness can be with me the rest of my days. And he makes a statement, if that be the case then, then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Folks, we need to have the church so excited to say, I will never leave this place. And we don't want to leave this place not because of the person standing here behind the pulpit. Is that not the reason that attracts people? It's not because of who's playing in the band. That's not what attracts people. It's because it's the church of Jesus Christ. And we say, I will not leave the church. When I was so frustrated in Kentucky and the way some things had went, I finally told Michelle, I, I got to leave this particular church because I feel like leaving the church altogether. And I don't want to get to the point where I'm upset at the whole church because of a few people. People are going to make us upset. People are going to frustrate us. But the church is more important than that. And folks, we can't abandon that. And too many of us abandon that. Too many of us quit on that. We do not understand that there's a great shepherd and that's who we should be following. And that's who we should be listening to. And that's the house that we should be dwelling in all the days of our lives. Today we've seen in this picture here, four pictures, that God is that great shepherd that leads us. He leads the sheep. He guides the sheep. He is that expert guide that knows every step. He knows the next step that you should take in your life. He knows the pitfalls that you need to stay away from. He is that wonderful host that prepares that banquet before you that says, come and eat. Eat freely and be filled. And he is that great physician that says, I know what your problem is and I have the ability to care for it. I have the ability to cure it. And the only response that we should say is, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so I just want to ask you today, where will you dwell? What house will you dwell in? The house that you build or the house of the Lord? Let's pray.